My name is Kelly Sittig. I'm the Executive Director at the Iowa Cancer Consortium. We are so pleased to have Dr. Jennifer Redmond Knight joining us again today. Today's webinar topic is online meeting facilitation tips and tricks. You'll notice a part one. We actually have been working with Dr. Knight and are excited to let you all know that later this summer, we're gonna offer a few more capacity building webinars with her, including online meeting facilitation tips and tricks part two. This is such a robust topic um, that we're going to make sure that we get another opportunity to benefit from Dr. Knight's wisdom and expertise in this area. So stay tuned for more information on that. If you've joined us for previous sessions with Dr. Knight, you'll be familiar with her background, but I'd love to share a little bit with you right now. Dr. Uh, Knight is a facilitator and public health professional who helps leaders responsible for coalitions like the Iowa Cancer Consortium. Partnerships and teams figure out how to get people to work better together so that they can make a greater impact together than they could on their own, which is right in line with the Iowa Cancer Consortium mission. Dr. Knight does this through her consulting business, as well as in her role as an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky College of Public Health and a member of the University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center Cancer Control Program. She serves as co-principal investigator for the Kentucky Cancer Consortium. She is co-principal investigator for the implementation of quality lung cancer screening component of Kentucky Leads, and is principal investigator for a self-made health network grant focused on lung cancer health equity among predominantly male work sites. She has experience and interest in group facilitation, partnership sustainability, leadership, emotional intelligence, program development, evaluation, cancer prevention and control, epidemiology, and policy systems and environmental change efforts. In 2017, she launched a website and weekly blog focused on helping people work better together. And again, that's the link that I've provided for you in the chat box today, um, jredmondknight.com. I hope you'll all take an opportunity to check that out. So thank you so much, Jennifer, again, for joining us. And we're looking forward to learning about online meeting facilitation today. Excellent. Thank you, Kelly. And um, as we get started, I know this is a topic that uh, as I got into it, I realized there's so much more we can talk about. And so one of the things that um, I wanted to do is just start with a story yet again, um, kind of an experience that I've had just several years ago. We were updating our cancer plan and uh, because of travel restrictions, because of challenges, we said, you know what, we are going to do this online. We'll do this through a webinar kind of function and allow people to participate. And so we thought that's a great idea. Uh, but the reality was there were, you know, maybe 15 people on the, the call slash um, computer and one or two were participating and that was it. And so we thought, what are we going to do? How are we going to engage people a little better? And so I decided to let people know I'm going to um, call on you specifically. And folks said, okay. And that's what I did. So I said, Sue, um, I, I haven't had a chance to hear from you yet. Um, do you agree with where we're headed? Or Tom, I know you're an expert in the data area. Um, could you let us know if we're on the right track? Is our target in line with the trends? Or is this something that we need to modify? What we discovered is that really helped us um, kind of engage more people. And so as I got to thinking about it, there's a lot of different tips and tricks that I've learned along the way that I hope that can help you too. Because online meeting facilitation is a different beast in some ways than the in-person, but it's something we're all doing in many ways. And so it's important to know how can we do it as best as we can to really get people to work better together. So um, as we think about kind of the purpose um, of the meeting. This is just as important of an in-person meeting as it is on an online meeting. Be really clear. This is super important to know why are you meeting? And as you want to, as you think about meeting, you also don't want to meet just to meet. So why are you meeting? And in that, um, we've kind of broken it down in a few areas. One is the reason why you're meeting. Uh, really know what it is. Uh, one of my favorite books as a resource is Patrick Lencioni's Death by Meeting. I don't know if any of you have read it, but it's a great book. Um, kind of gives you that aha moment and it helps give some ideas on 
uh, why we meet and some ways we can do better meetings, really. Um, the second piece is think about what people need to know before the meeting. Uh, one of those things is probably going to be the agenda. Uh, for most folks, um, they really want to see the agenda before they join the meeting. And one of the best ways to provide this is at least a week, if not two weeks ahead of the meeting. So when you kind of schedule your meeting, you provide the why, but then it's helpful for folks to really know what to expect. It's also helpful if there's things that you're going to discuss that you want them to be familiar with to go ahead and send them that ahead of time too. Usually a week in advance is a pretty good amount of time um, to think about, but just think about what, what do people need to know. Some people would like to know who the speakers are and if it applies to them. So providing that information can be really helpful in terms of getting people to participate online. And then the third piece is what is a realistic agenda for your time frame? So you may know why, and you have a lot of different things going on, but it is so critical to think about really what you can do in that time frame. So um, I'll give you a very applicable story. Just this week, um, later this week actually, we have a lung cancer network meeting. And we haven't met in a while. There's been a lot of different things happening and we haven't convened and we're gonna do it online. And we've decided to allow an hour and a half, which is way longer than I usually recommend, but it's been a while, so we're saying okay. Well, also because it's been a while, I had said, well, gosh, we need to cover all kinds of things. And so I laid, basically laid out seven to eight things that I thought we should try to get in, in the meeting. And thankfully, I sent that to my um, leadership team for this group and said, what do you think? Is this too much? And they said, yes. <laughs> so thankfully, they reined me in again and said, there's no way. We j this has to be two different meetings. Uh, if we're going to have some good discussion and good engagement, we need to keep it realistic. And so now there's four things um, that we're focused on in that hour and a half time frame. But it's really important to gain feedback from folks and really think about what's realistic, especially if you're not good at being realistic, which sometimes that's my case. So participation. Oh, it is so critical. And it's gonna take your best emotional intelligence skills. Um, and sometimes you can't even see folks and that will be kind of a discussion for the, the next part two webinar. But uh, participation is critical in any meeting, of course. If you're gonna hold a meeting, you want people to participate. But online, it may look a little different and it actually will look a little different than it will in person. So there's kind of three pieces of participation um, or three kind of elements of participation that I wanna highlight for us today. One is it's helpful to set expectations. You really want people to know what to expect and follow through with those, um, including the why for the meeting, including the um, who's participating. You wanna know what's going on. And then engagement. That could be an entire webinar in itself. Um, I'm gonna provide you a few tips and tricks around engagement, um, but I, hopefully you guys will be able to kind of think about this, apply it, and then maybe we can chat about it in the next webinar too. And then the third piece is efficiency. You want people um, to move forward. And in many ways, we'll go into some details, but the size of the meeting matters um, from a participation standpoint. The smaller the meeting, um, the more chance you're gonna have for engagement and participation. So uh, I'm gonna dive into each of these a little more in depth. So expectations. One of the things that's really critical, and Kelly obviously does a great job of this for the Iowa Cancer Consortium, and that is start on time and end on time. And for me, I got to say, this can be really difficult. Um, there are times uh, that, you know, we have all kinds of things going on. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I try to pack in too many things and then I end up late. And so it really makes it hard for people to engage when um, either the meeting starts late or participants show up late. And, and similarly, if you're leading a meeting and you're continuing to wait till five minutes after you're supposed to start to start the meeting, then people are kind of losing interest. And so the start on time, end on time is really important. And it's also helpful to set that expectation to others as well. The other piece that's important is to model that. So start practicing being on time to meetings, um, even if you're not leading those meetings. The next piece is being specific and alerting attendees that you're gonna ask for specific feedback. So let them know at the beginning that you're gonna call on them. And this is not to scare them, it's not to be punitive, it's not to um, say, oh my goodness, are you paying any attention to me? It's to really get that feedback and know that everybody's feedback is valuable and it can be really helpful for people to, um, to hear 
from others on the, the call. If you want people to be engaged, let them know you're gonna, let, you're gonna call on them, but in a, in a respectful way. And if when you do call on them, they kind of say, I, I don't have anything, just reassure them, that's okay. You don't have to, but you just wanted to make sure that if they had something to say, they had an opportunity to say it. The next, or, and actually a part of that too, is providing some framework on the amount of time you want people to share. You know, some people are very verbose and um, they could talk for three minutes straight without even pausing or taking a breath. And then you've got other people who don't have a lot to say and they don't want a whole lot of time. But for those very verbose people, it's sometimes helpful to give an expectation that you may, you know, want folks to chime in for 30 seconds or, you know, maybe a minute maximum or something. Think about your time frame. Um, but ex again, communicate those expectations to folks. The next peak is piece is communicate guiding principles. How do you want those meetings to go? Um, and this may relate, I know um, your Iowa Cancer Consortium staff have got rules of engagement that are really fantastic. If you haven't seen them, can be um, maybe adopted as some of the guiding principles you want to use for your meetings. There may be others and, and they can be as simple as listen, you know, actively listen to what's going on or be respectful, do not interrupt, uh, be a teacher of others and a learner from others. Again, come up with those expectations that make sense for you and your meeting and make sure everybody's familiar with that and, and that you model that again. So the next piece is engagement. And as I said, engagement, we could go on and on, um, but there's several different aspects that I think are important. The first is get to know one another. If you have a group where you've already been meeting and you know people well, one of the things that I do in those situations is I'll look to see like who the participants are and kind of do a roll call, if you will, and just say, you know, Kelly, are you here? Tessa, are you here? Um, Kelly, are you here? You know, what those look like um, can be really helpful in terms of just getting engagement, moving quickly, but making sure you know who's on the phone, who's on the computer, and how are you gonna engage those folks. If people don't know, in each other very well. And if you've got a fairly small group, maybe 10 to 15, then take a little bit of time at the beginning of your meeting to do some introductions. People can say their name, the organization they're with, and how they're connected to the topic at hand. Because you know clearly the purpose, people can kind of chime in on why they're there and why they think it's important. The next piece is solicit specific feedback. You've warned them. <laughs> so you've told people you're gonna ask for it, then ask for it. And I think that really helps people know that they've been valued as you move forward in the meeting. And again, like I said, allow space and time. People may not have something to say and just reassure them that's okay. Um, you just wanted to check in and make sure they had a voice. Use the chat feature. We're doing that today. Uh, and you have an opportunity to, to chat what's going on. What I've discovered in a lot of webinars, even if you're not all muted, um, people feel a lot more comfortable chatting their questions than they do speaking their questions. So I encourage you to use that for folks to feel comfortable with questions. Share your screen. Oh, I can't say this enough, and it relates to a lot of different areas, and I'll go into depth um, in the productivity section later. Uh, but this can be really helpful for focusing and engaging people. They can see what's going on. You're typing as you go or somebody's typing as you go um, and kind of taking notes live or adjusting things live. That really helps with engagement. Show your face. Um, if you have video capability and you can show your face, especially if you're leading or facilitating the meeting, that can be really helpful. People can see you're there, you're engaged, you want to hear from them. Showing your face can be helpful. And then and the final thing is reconvene if needed. Um, use those emotional intelligence skills that you developed um, from the first week and that you're continuing to develop. Find out, is this topic tense? Are people struggling a little bit? Um, if so, it's okay to pause. It's okay to kind of say, you know what, maybe what we need to do is come back together again. Um, if nobody's wanting to say anything on the meeting, even though you've kind of asked specifically and folks are uncomfortable, then pause. Encourage people to maybe email you some of their thoughts. Uh, maybe have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with people and then bring the group back together after you've addressed things that might be a little bit difficult. So then the next piece is going to be the efficiency piece. In this, I'm going to encourage you, especially if you're going to have a working meeting, to keep that group small. Ten people, even five people, to be honest, can be great. As you know from probably your experience in in-person meetings, those online meetings just the same, you can get a lot done oftentimes in a smaller group. And uh, what has worked well um, for me in this is to take kind of our topic at hand and then just break it down into subgroups or sub kind of sections to work on. 
And this can be helpful. The other piece that can be helpful in this is when you have a small group, those people who may say, I am not showing my video, may be willing to show their video if it's a smaller group. And that's particularly if it's like three to five people, maybe you'll let, you'll be able to engage them. Whereas they're really a little uncomfortable with being seen on video if it's a large group. Uh, and then the next piece is keep the meeting short. So unlike the meeting that I'm about to hold, that's an hour and a half. I think that's the rarity. And that really can happen if it's mostly an update meeting, not so much a, um, a, a action meeting. You know, I, again, it's really tricky when you have a longer meeting. My recommendation, if you can do it, is start to have 30 minute meetings. Um, we're trying to do these webinars in 30 minutes in many ways to say this is a realistic time frame. Folks can often take step away from what they're doing, join in for some quick action, and then kind of come back together again. The other piece that's important is staying focused on the meeting topic. Again, you've told them why, you've told them what's going on, um, and you're sharing your screen, you're taking those notes, but it's really helpful in moving forward in an efficient manner is to stay focused on that meeting topic. Obviously, there's gonna be some things that come up, some discussions that may be a little off the track, um, but similar to what we discussed last week about the consensus building and finding a decision when there's a lot of different options, create those bike racks. And again, those are my healthy parking lots um, recommendation to say, you know what, we'll talk about this. Um, we'll make a note of it even on the screen as you're sharing your screen to follow up with that, but kind of move back to the topic at hand. Thank folks for their participation, but again, stay focused on that meeting topic. So productivity, uh, and this kind of goes hand in hand um, with the efficiency, but I think you want to keep it efficient so people stay engaged and they really participate with you. Um, but then you also, for that participation, you want to be productive in what you do. Ultimately, you want to accomplish things that you're doing, and that's going to help you have more meetings that people will come back to. You know, one of the things that I've discovered is I want to be a part of a meeting that's moving forward and we're doing things and making a difference. I really don't want to be a meeting that is always going to be just sitting and one person is talking and you're just, you know, listening all the time. You want to be productive moving forward. And again, it can be tricky in an online meeting, but it can be done and can actually be even more productive sometimes than an in-person meeting. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to encourage you again, share your screen. This really impacts your engagement, your efficiency, and your productivity. When you share your screen, everybody sees what's going on, and we'll go into depth in that in a moment. Follow up. Oh, this is so critical. Um, and it's so, in some ways simple. Do what you say you're going to do and do it in a timely manner. And then the third piece um, is share responsibility. There's a tendency for some folks to say, oh, my gosh, I have to do it all. If it's going to be done, I've got to do it. But what happens is then it's hard to get it all done because you don't have time to do it all. And you miss out on the opportunity for other ownership and other kind of coming together in your group. So be willing to share responsibility to be more productive as a work group. So sharing your screen. Um, gosh, you know, I, I know I've said this a lot of times, but I'm going to say that's probably one of my favorite tips, if you will, because it helps you see what's going on. One of the things I like to do when I'm doing an online meeting is have the agenda up. Uh, and and I, it kind of goes into my take notes live piece, but that allows me to, to take notes as we go so people can see what's going on. Uh, and then you are keeping people engaged and you are not having to take extra notes and come back and write them all up. And it can be one of the best benefits of the online meeting. The other benefit is people don't have to travel. Um, so there's not the expense of travel or the time in travel. I don't know about you guys, but for a long time, it would be amazing. I could easily spend three hours out of the office, just traveling to a meeting, spending time in an hour meeting, traveling back to a meeting. When you do an online meeting, it's like there's the hour and it's not three, it's one instead of three. Uh, the other piece is it really allows you to engage people that are in the entire state. You don't have to just have a meeting that only those people can drive to. The online meeting can be real helpful. And the sharing your screen again is really helpful in that place so they can all feel engaged in participating. And, and as I said, the taking notes live can be helpful. Now it can be intimidating sometimes because um, depending upon your spelling or your comfort, comfort with spelling, you know, as you're making notes live, those spelling errors are obvious. And so folks may be a little uncomfortable, but it also makes it very real and very um, relatable. So you can kind of connect and you can even, 
make jokes about those things to engage people a little further um, as you're taking notes and as people be, are connected. The next piece is I'm gonna say, ask for feedback. When you share your screen, people can see um, what you're doing and what you're writing. And especially like if you're updating your cancer plan, uh, you can say, is this what I heard everybody say? Or maybe it, are, are we off base? So what does that look like? The sharing your screen can really help. So um, the next piece is following up. And as I said, you know, the follow-up is critical. I mean, kind of everything is critical in this piece, but the follow-up um, can help people know, okay, we are really connected here. We are moving forward uh, and there's not time to forget what it is you talked about. So one of those pieces is send notes quickly. You know, since you've taken those notes while you are um, on the screen and in the meeting, you're sharing those screen, it shouldn't take you too long to kind of tweak them a little bit, make a few highlights or whatever, and then send those back out that day or the next day. It can really help you keep that momentum in moving forward in productivity. Include action steps. Oh, this is so critical. Um, and it can be real simple, bullet points that says, here's what we're gonna do. And then kind of within that, highlight those people that are responsible, um, not only what you're gonna do, but who's gonna do it. And then the, the last piece is gonna be incorporating deadlines. I don't know about you guys, but I operate on deadlines. You know, what's coming next, and that is how I schedule things in terms of what's going on. So if you're gonna to wanna to move forward in a productive way from an online meeting, you're going to want to incorporate deadlines and this applies really to any meeting honestly you want to make sure you know what you're doing who's doing it and when it's going to happen uh, you may need to modify i mean the reality is as you're working with work groups and the consortium members folks are mostly volunteers in these capacities so those those deadlines may have to change and it's okay to modify but at least have a starting place that helps people know okay here's our next steps here's how we're going to follow up and here's how we're going to move forward so I know, um, the, oh, I'm sorry, the next piece is share responsibility. So this, uh, this piece is really, you know, one of those that can be hard for some folks and really easy for other folks. Uh, in this place, I mean, understanding the roles of staff, your board, your volunteer leadership, and your membership can be helpful. Who is willing and able to do different areas? To be honest, in most situations, in things like the Iowa Cancer Consortium, or for my experience, the Kentucky Cancer Consortium, the role of the staff, honestly, is a lot of the responsibility, moving things forward, doing a lot of the different work, but not all of the work. And it's so critical to understand, you know, who is willing to do other aspects and really build ownership um, as kind of my last point, but really kind of say who's doing what. And we can share this so that when you have great results and great impacts, it's a shared um, celebration, really. So really understand those roles and share that responsibility. Recognize the expertise is the other piece in that. So how do you decide who does what? Well, who does different things well? That adds a great quality um, as well as just, again, that ownership. And that shared responsibility helps people see, boy, we've done this together. One of the things that I uh, learned early, early on in cancer control and, and comprehensive cancer control kind of work is the difference um, when we were doing evaluation between attribution and contribution. And I won't go into too much depth there, but basically the idea is attribution is saying, you know what, you can um, say this happened because this other piece happened, or boy, um, I can take complete credit for this happening. Contribution, on the other hand, is, you know what, there's been a lot of people contribute to this, so let's find out how we can share that. Let's all get credit for that. Let's all of our organizations benefit from this one product we collectively developed. So, I know that's a lot. How about some questions? And then I'll follow up with um, a few action steps for you. Karen Beachler um, asked what uh, book you had referenced, uh, Jennifer, and I did go ahead and put it in the chat for everybody. It's Death by a Meeting by Patrick Linsani. I never pronounced his name correctly, um, but I did put the link as well to the book on, for Amazon. Excellent. Yep. Patrick Lencioni, I think Lencioni. how you say it, but again, um, Death by Meeting is a great one, and it's a quick read. He does a fable kind of um, approach, and so some good nuggets in that. 
Thank you, Jennifer. And I'll add that um, if you, if anybody wants to add another question into the chat box or the Q and A, uh, we will make sure to get those answered. We have just a few minutes. I don't see any other questions popping up right at the moment. Well, and the beautiful thing is too, since we're doing a part two, um, if there's something that comes up after this that you say, ah, oh, I wish you would address how in the world you deal with some people who are on the screen and versus off the screen and those kind of things, which is one of the things I'm going to address, uh, then uh, we will definitely try to incorporate that. So um, let Kelly know um, what those questions are and or Tessa. So keep us posted. Absolutely. Thank you. I see, let's see, uh, Kelly Hendershot, we do have one question that's come up. Kelly Hendershot asks, I may have missed this, but it's their software you both recommend and would give, you both recommend and would give caution again against using, I think is what she's asking. Yeah, so for online meetings, um, I, what I will say is Zoom is my favorite. So we're using Zoom right now. I use Zoom in my Kentucky work now. Um, and I've used a lot of different things from Google Hangout to Skype to GoToMeeting to Adobe Connect, and they are okay, but Zoom, as I was explaining to somebody just the other day, is computer neutral. So if you have a Mac or a PC, Zoom seems to work pretty friendly on either one, whereas some of the others are really kind of more PC friendly versus Mac friendly versus others. So um, that, that'd be my recommendation on that, but we'll talk more in the next session as well on those. Thank you. I think that is our last question as of right now. Okay, so to close this out, um, three overall tips to remember. I know I talked about a lot of different things, um, but when you're doing an online meeting or any other meeting, have your purpose clear. Know what it is, communicate it, and stick with it. Uh, participate. Engage your audience and work group directly in participating in what's going on. Um, call people by name in a kind way, not in a punitive way, but really engage participation. And then be productive with those meetings. Share your screen, as I've said many times, and the responsibility. Be sure that you follow up with what's going on and you are going to have a fantastic online meeting. So, as I have in the past, um, I will continue action steps. I think it's so critical for us to have something to kind of take home uh, in terms of what you can do with this. So by, before Friday of this week, um, if you can, schedule 15 minutes, just 15 minutes, to reflect on the last meeting you either led or participated in. So think about a meeting and then take some notes. What would you like to do differently or what would you like to have had done differently if you were not leading the meeting in your next meeting. So then choose one thing that you wrote down and implement that in your next meeting. So again, schedule that time, reflect on what's happened in past meetings, and then take notes on what one thing you want to implement. And then I'm going to also encourage you to visit um, jredmanknight.com for more ideas and suggestions um, on these. I do blog posts once a week. Um, would love to update you with those things and provide additional steps. And actually, one of the free things that I offer um, for signing up um, to receive email updates is an ebook that I created on how to be lead your best meeting yet. So some additional tips there. Uh, so again, take those notes, schedule that time, and thank you um, for joining me um, again today. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thanks to everybody who participated today. I am going to share a link right now in the chat box um, for an evaluation of today's webinar. We really do take your feedback very seriously, so if you um, wouldn't mind taking just about one minute to fill out that survey, that would be wonderful. And again, watch for upcoming information about some uh, additional webinars from Dr. Knight coming up later this summer. We'll be sure to share that information out, out widely. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Jennifer, so much for your great information. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Bye.